Welcome to the Habitat Podcast, the podcast for wildlife habitat management, hunting strategy, and land stewardship. And now, your host, Jared Van Hees. Welcome back, everybody, to the 50th episode of the Habitat Podcast, where we are here to become better habitat managers. I'm your host, Jared Van Hees, my co-host, Brian Hallbly on the line. And we want to thank you listeners for tuning in once again for number 50. Brian, I never thought we'd uh, be where we're at, 50 episodes in, buddy. Big milestone, man. <laughs> it's like 50th anniversary, but the only problem is I didn't get you anything. <laughs> well, you can make up for it, that's for sure. <laughs> no, I'm just, uh, you know, blessed to to be doing this with you and you know we we've learned so much over the past 50 episodes and this one is no different uh number 50 here but i mean i just want to thank all of our guests the 49 guests prior to this and uh you know you the co-host for coming on and all your help and the listeners of course i mean without their support and and the faithful tuning in every week i mean wouldn't be where we are so i'm just i'm pumped man i'm pumped i'm humbled I'm excited. I don't know. All things right now. Yeah, nice job, man. You, you started this from an idea and to see how far you brought this and just, just the amount of information, like you mentioned, in the guests and the the feedback and the in the conversations online and offline and the friendships and just there's there's so much to reflect on. I'm just really appreciative that you gave me this opportunity to be the ho- the co host and uh Looking forward to the next fifty, man. Heck yeah! Well, we're gonna we're gonna blow up the next fifty, and thank you for the nice words. And you're right, the friendships are actually the most important thing we've come across so far. Um, Absolutely. You know, meeting you at that at that bar after the QDMA forum days, and then a lot of the guests that I've got to li- meet and and listen to, and the ones that you've met and you know came in contact with. I mean, this is all just that and the knowledge um the people and the knowledge are are the best things that i can take away from this i mean it's the reason we do this and i just i love it no doubt well this episode guys is going to be no different uh we have number 50 none other than jake elinger now jake if you guys remember was our number one guest episode number one Jake is uh, the owner of Habitat Solutions 360, and he is a just a Habitat guru, the Habitat guru. We had him on for number one. We had him on for his game plan episode when he killed uh, his really nice buck early October in 2018. And then, I, you know, I figured, you know what, let's get him on for number 50. But this one's a little bit different. Jake actually invited me down to his property, the Elinger uh legacy property and you know we were able to take a couple hours and tour his farm showed me everything he's done habitat wise over the past how many years he's owned it and you know what brian my mind was just blown um he was nice enough to record a podcast after the tour was done so we sat there in his office and uh looked at all his deer and and talked for you know about an hour and 20 minutes which you're all gonna hear next so yeah, that, that's pretty awesome that you got to get on there and check that out. I've been following Jake for a lot of years and seeing his videos and how he's got his property laid out. Uh, that's that's something I'd definitely like to check out someday just to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. And uh, you said he was kind enough to invite us back, and I'm looking forward to getting over there one of these days and checking it all out. Yes, sir, we will have to do that. I do know where he lives, so we can go surprise him one day. Yeah. <laughs> no, but everybody uh get excited. We have a Jake Elinger property tour episode coming up next. We talk about 30 different subjects it seems. I'm not going to list them all right this second, but we're going to get Jake on the line here in a moment. I just wanted to mention uh you know we have big things coming with the podcast. We are designing a new website right now. We are going to be launching uh a line of a lot of merchandise, more like apparel, some hats and some shirts, decals, things like that. Uh, all Habitat podcast stuff that you listeners can come check out. And, uh, you know, then again, we just really want to uh, 
thank you guys for for tuning in and and supporting us. Couldn't do it without you. So, lastly, I'd like to thank our sponsors: Five Two Outdoors, Killer Food Plots, Packer Max Culta Packers, Dip That Hydrographics, Michigan Whitetail Pursuit. And the Habitat Hook from Nick Nation. Without further ado, here is Jake Elinger and the Farm Tour. All right, everybody, we're here with Jake Elinger down on the Legacy property. How you doing, Jake? Yeah, I'm doing fine. It's a beautiful day to be out walking around in God's creation today, huh, Jared? Oh my gosh, ah, uh, understatement. I yeah. just walked some of the best deer hunting ground I've ever <laughs> been on. I think. Well, thank you. I uh, mean. You, uh, like I said on the, on the tour, it is, it is overwhelming the amount of work that you put in. And just so everybody knows, I came down here in Jake's farm today in Southern Michigan. He gave me the tour, spent a few hours out there learning what Jake does, how he does it. And, uh, I mean, the fruits of his labor are posted up on the wall in here. So, you know, it's real good information. And I just want to thank you once more for oh, letting hey, me come you're, down. You're welcome. You can tell I, I enjoy sharing. I want to I want to help people learn. Yep. And if there's a f- half a dozen things you saw that stuck out that you can incorporate on your own property, then awesome. You know, yep. that means you're gonna have a better hunting season in a few oh, years. Oh man, you can see my <laughs> list here. There's more than a yeah. half dozen. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there are. Oh uh, well, I guess let's get it started. You've been on the show a few times before, and uh, one thing you you said. And we talked a lot about this today while we were having a bite to eat in there. That the amount of work you put in, the you know, the the why you do what you do out there. Um, you mentioned that the eighty twenty rule. What does that mean to you? Uh, you asked me if I knew what it meant, and I, I let you kind of answer it you know, your way, and um, I think it was a great explanation. Um, what, what it is applies to a lot of different things, from volunteer organizations, corporate entities. There's usually there's. Eighty percent of the work is usually contributed by twenty percent of the people, meaning the effort. Yep. Okay. Yep. So in deer habitat, uh, a deer, a buck, or a group of deer has a home range, and so what you want to do is get those deer to spend eighty percent of their time on twenty percent of their home range, and that your property, your habitat, should encompass that twenty percent home range. And if you can do that, you're going to get a lot more daylight movement. I think you're right. I th- what what is a deer's normal um, range of travel? Do you have any idea? Uh, I mean, you know, know, it, it can change, but it, you know, when you go big woods, hill country, yep. uh, open country. Here we're in we're in uh, I want to say kind of a checkerboard southern Michigan river mm-hmm. bottoms, lakes. Mm-hmm. I think a typical buck home range is in that 500 to 1200 or more acres. A, a lot of individual personality plays into that, but yeah. if you were to pick a number. Say from five yeah. to a thousand acres. Okay, you know, it's kind okay. of their home range. So if you can take twenty percent of five hundred acres, well, now you're down to around you know seventy acres of that, right? So if I can dial in that seventy acres, which you had a chance to see some of today, and make it where a deer spends pretty much all his time on, and you saw the all the multiple bedding and the the travel yes. corridors and where the scrapes and the licking branches, and then I've also really improved my access and i have some really great pinch points which are dialed in for wind directions and time of year and you can get pretty good at predicting deer movement and capitalize on it but it's not easy it takes work yeah yeah that was one of the main things that that was just overwhelming to me is you have um a lot of hinge cut bedding areas oh yeah um bedrooms whatever you want to call them and and I've done a little bit of that work, and I know how much work it takes to fell a tree, a big tree, in the right direction without getting it to break or hinge cut a tree, all that. And you've done it over, well, we walked through 25 acres of it, yeah, give or take yeah. a few. Yeah. Um, and it's just on and on and on of just bedding and thick, thick cover with food everywhere. And, and, and ultimately, my goal when I started was to remove a closed canopy. Yep no understory woods and turn it into early successional growth and and i learned like everybody that's probably hearing this podcast for the first time you're a beginner you don't know where to start we'll start somewhere yep it's it's one step at a time you're going to make some mistakes you're also going to have some successes and so over the years i learned you know i let the deer teach me an awful lot about what's right they're going to tell you right away what they like they're also going to show you what they don't like i showed you some spots where i had done some cuts 
I hunted out of a stand. I realized deer seemed to get here and act dead ended, so I cut paths through there. And you saw as soon as I made those openings, there's a mud path of deer going through there, so they like that spot. They didn't want to be pinched in right there. Yep. And so nothing. It's not like you're going to hit it out of the you know right. out of the. It's not going to be a home run every every time. Right. But early successional growth and getting sunlight to the ground still is something I talk a lot about because we hear about food plots. We hear a lot about mast crops. We hear a lot, and that's all important, but without early successional growth and multiple age classes of, of tree species, you name it, um, that's a deer's world because they're an edge creature. Uh, yeah, no, and and I think you, you said it great. I think um, one of the things that I kept asking, and at least in one way or another, was, you know, why did you do it this way, or, or how did you learn you know, that your hinge curtain need to be tweaked a little bit. Well, because you observed it, you did some cutting. Yeah. To your point, mm-hmm. you didn't do it all right out the gate. You did some cutting. You watched how it was working. You watched where the deer were getting held up. Told me some cool stories about a buck being over here, a doe sneaking back through over here, and just trying yeah. to get away from him. And yeah. Just some awesome stuff. But so, your observation was... Oh, yeah. Ob- yeah. And then continuing to monitor and, and that plan. And, you know, plan. Um, it, it doesn't matter if it's a... Uh, podcast or a blog page a lot of hunters that are good hunters that are going on on whether it's public ground or private ground they talk about most recent information Mm -hmm. mri well it's the same thing you're going into an area that you've done some habitat work and now you've got to obtain that mri how are the deer using it do they like what you did are there changes you need to make to it it's never a one and done okay yeah it's not like going here and work for two weekends now i'm good for the next 10 years it's just not like that no no No, I uh, I realized again, I know I said it before, maybe on the last podcast or the one before, uh, walking to Alan's place, I realized I need to cut a lot more. Yeah. And all he was talking about was you the whole time. And, <laughs> and then I walk your place out here and I see uh, you're really dropping some trees. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, I've, I've had to. And it, and it it was very slow in the beginning. I, okay. I didn't. Uh, How did that evolve? You know, uh, it, it evolved through just realizing that what once was good hunting 10 years later was not good hunting and what happened during that 10 years is the canopy closed up the understory went away and so did the deer and it just you know i'm hard-headed sometimes you just believe well this always used to be a good spot must must be it was a bad year the wind was wrong uh maybe the you know we're good at making excuses aren't we next year will be better yes and so and that was when i first bought this property so for everybody listening i bought the property in, in 1981 so from 81 through about 91, I fooled with minor changes, but didn't never did anything in a big scale. And it was about 91 that the light bulb went off, and it was like, I got to make big changes. And that was planting the trees, taking some of the tillable out, getting conifers growing, going in and cutting trees, trees and realizing that I've got to open up the canopy. That now, how did you realize that in 91? Like, what was the thing where you were like... Well, there was, uh, there was a spot that my wife and I used to go to. We were wood burners at one time. Okay. And, and not so much anymore just because, you know, we don't need to. But there was a time where we really enjoyed it, and, and that was just all part of the family activity. And we had pictures of when we were younger in there cutting trees. And then you – so you're eight, nine years later looking at these pictures, and you realize it's not near as thick in there anymore. You don't notice that from year to year. The degrade is slow Good enough that we don't notice it. And I tell a lot of my clients when they're standing in their their closed canopy woods and they know they're going to go in there and they're probably going to do a timber harvest to start with and get get a bunch of money, get those big trees down, and then they're going to go in and start doing hinge cutting, creating openings and everything to my plan. I say, find a tree, realize whether you're, you're looking south, whatever direction, take one picture every year for the next five years and watch how it changes. I said, you won't That's notice gross. it, but when you compare those five pictures, you're going to see the dramatic change that's going on. I said, you're going to know you're doing the right thing. That's a great idea. So I, I do it a lot. You know, you've seen some of my videos. Oh, yeah. I do a lot of them. I, yeah. I take a lot of pictures and, and learn that when I'm over here in this section, I face to the south and over here, I'm looking to the east and that that's sort true. of thing. Yeah. Okay. And so that was in the 91 came. Yeah. And you realize. Yeah. Planted a bunch of trees. Planted a bunch of cut trees. Cut a bunch more down. H- had a timber harvest. Okay. okay. Hired a, a local timber company, and they came through and marked trees and took a bunch of trees. And I thought in the beginning that was going to be my answer. Oh, I'll just get a bunch of oaks and maples cut out of here, and life's going to be good. And it was good for about two years. And the canopy closed right back up. That fast. Yeah, I got maybe two years of good growth. No and way. then it slowed down. 
And that was, you know, so now I'm getting into the, you know, maybe in the mid 90s now and I'm realizing things have to change. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just started watching what deer were doing and started tipping trees. And, you know, the term hinge cutting was showing up here and there. And so I started trying and I cut at an angle like everybody else did back in those days. And, uh, you know, it just developed. And in the beginning, I just made a mess. There was no rhyme or reason. I just thought, oh, I'm just going to. And I was doing a good thing because I was getting sunlight to the ground. And I was growing early successional growth. But I didn't have, it was random deer movement. There was no particular place. And you can see in the places we were today, I've gotten, random now. I've gotten real exact about There's where the deer random. are coming and going. You know, and, it is, yep. and it's pretty neat because you can dial in where to hunt, when to hunt. So much better that way. And oh, even okay. though there's a, you know, that big, the biggest area we're in probably takes in about four and a half, five acres. Pretty major hinge cut. A lot of trees knocked down. Still got some big trees growing, but a lot, yep. of, a lot of open canopy. And within that, there's four or five major trail systems. And they enter and exit in distinct places. And you notice there were stands on both ends. Definitely. Yeah. So lots of times of the year, you're not focused on the core of that. You know it's happening. But if you can just get to the outside without those deer knowing you're there and the winds are right, then you're going to have deer entering and exiting, and there you are. Or traveling yeah. downwind yeah. of the entire bedding area. Oh, yeah. Like yeah. that one trail that you showed me, that was, the deer made that. Oh, yeah. You didn't make that. No. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, that was awesome. It, it's pretty cool. Uh, there was an area, I think I called it the Brutus Hinge Cut. And so I worked on it really hard. Uh, this is well after, I. it hasn't been that long ago, four or five years ago, but I really knew what I was doing. Took several weekends to get it right. But within six months after making that cut, there was a brand new travel deer path that you saw running right along the edge of it that never existed there before. Because deer are really good at identifying an edge and where that change, that transition in stem density. So it went from fairly open park effect woods to extremely tight stem density. And right on that edge was this new deer trail. Yeah, yeah, for, yeah no, uh, for everybody uh, who's not exactly maybe picking up what we're saying, Jake had a large... Large hinge cut, hinge cut area, four to five acres maybe. How big was that area? About that size? Uh, or maybe even the, the Brutus hinge yeah. cut. That's probably uh, at this point about one and a half to two acres. Well, I'm way off. Okay. Yeah. It looks really big. Yeah, it does. Today, when we're walking yeah. around. Um, well, what we're saying is a buck likes to travel the downwind side of a bedding area. Yep. So that's where he travels during the rut to smell any does and he yeah. could be an estrus in there or like you said the deer like to walk they're an edge creature yeah uh, and they like to walk an edge like that and you created that edge but didn't create the deer trail the deer trail did they did that themselves yeah that's very cool and then i got real strategic in how i placed my stand and then i built a barrier behind it to leave about a 30 yard gap knowing that when the wind is from the north or northwest the deer were going to travel on the, the south side, side of that yeah which there i was waiting for him you know so yeah. it, it's a, it works very well you know i uh, there isn't a hunt i go in there and i don't see some pretty nice deer so you're you're very um strategic when you hunt and uh how you set up this whole habitat plan at yeah. first you were cutting trees and get some sunlight down on the canopy but now you've really dialed that in i have yep. um and, and i've you know as the years you know like with anything you do you get better at it mm -hmm. you know and it's because you make a lot of mistakes in the beginning yeah and what was what, that quote you said earlier about a master yeah a master can uh a master is successful because of the number of mistakes he's made. Yeah. Okay. Because he's made a lot of them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I <laughs> yeah. get it. I yeah. get it. Uh, probably if there's anything uh, that I've learned in habitat management concerning early successional growth is uh, we're, we're going to have varieties of deer density depending on the seasons. Okay. And there are times of the year I have a lot of deer on this property. There are times like right now I probably have the lowest number of deer. You know, I'm probably down to the typical 25, 30 deer that roam throughout this property. And that's a probably an equal balance of does and bucks. And the does haven't dropped fawns yet, but any day now we're yep. right there. And, and then in as, December you have... Oh, yeah. And so we get... So uh, uh, October gets here and deer start increasing. And then gun season gets here and that's november 15th and it seems like it takes three to four days and i probably double my deer herd at that point that's you know, crazy. by thanksgiving i've got twice as many deer than i had in mid-october i just yep. noticed this and and along with that comes bucks that maybe i got one or two pictures of in the summertime and now i'm getting three pictures a week awesome because now he's moved in and and as you saw he's got all those bucks and all these different deer have lots of locations because i've created 
a lot of places for doe groups to bed, lots of places for individual bucks to bed. And so they can still carry on with their competition and their rutting behavior. And, you know, I, I used a comment uh, when we were out there. I said, build a thousand room Hilton hotel for 50 to 75 guests and let them decide which one to use. And so you never quite know which room they're going to use, but it's there for them when they need it. I love it. And, and what that does is that you can accept more deer on your property. The does aren't going to push any bucks out or whatever people say about that. Um, you have, you know, 900 extra rooms, if you will. Oh, yeah. And, yep. and it kind of uh, evolves into your the thing you've been doing more recently, some of those openings. Right. Um, tell me how the 1,000-room hotel can kind of... It's, so th- to those you know, the, the one thing you remember about deer, and, and I, uh, I think I'll add this piece of information in there. The more you know about deer biology, why deer do what they do at certain times of the year, the easier it is for you to focus on what habitats those deer will be using. Deer are very social animals, be it doe family groups and their fawns, to young bucks, to, to bucks in bachelor groups during the summer, to where they're all separated and now the bucks won't have anything to do with anybody during the rut and that, you know, all that entire competition. But they are social. There's certain areas within a property they do make contact, you know. So in these bedding areas, instead of one big, thick area that's kind of random, I create a lot of openings with a networks of trails. And these openings will be 20 feet by 40 feet. Yeah, not very uh, big. Not very big. And a lot of early succession all around them. But there is not one. And you were in several of them today there's not one place a deer can go he can't go right left forward backward i have yep. multiple trails leading to and from these openings get uh, overseeded with chicory and clover to grow abundant food for that 10 to 15 days of the rut when the does have had it with the bucks chasing them in the large fields and now they're moving into the cover and a doe's got to eat four five six times a day anyways yep So those does move in, and they've got not only the cover to get away from all those bucks that are constantly pushing them in these open fields, because they're not quite in in heat yet, but the bucks know they're very close. And guess who moves right in with them? And and you saw I have multiple isolated individual bedding locations, and we of course we walked up on that one this morning that was... He was hot. I mean, there was hair all over. He's flattened it down. Big old track, so you know he's, he's in there. And so, and then you can see where the does are 40 yards away in one of those little openings spending time in there. So if there's anything I've learned is multiple openings with networks of trails, kind of a maze effect. But that maze does have a plan. Mm -hmm. It all funnels into one area that I can hunt on the west side of it, the east side of it, the south side of it, or the north. So depending on that wind direction, I can always position myself where I need to be so when those mature bucks are traveling downwind of these bedding areas. And, and yeah. everybody's got their own goals, but for me, that's my goal. I do like mature deer. doesn't have to have a huge set of antlers, but I love being able to get close to something four and a half and older, if I yep. possibly can. Yep. That's an admirable goal. I, uh, <laughs> it's a lofty one, I'll tell yeah, you that. Hey, that's no problem setting goals high. That's, nope. uh, that's, nope. that's admirable in itself. Um, and, and the interesting part about that is some people might say don't put food in your bedding areas because you want to be able to hunt them. Well, from where this bed was in this opening that we walked through, I could see your tree stand. Oh yeah. I mean, you're in. You're in there. I'm right at on the right top time of year. At the right time of the year, and that's the key is understanding. There's so o- that there's yeah. only about ten days out of the year that you can even get in there. That you right. dare go in there. And then, of course, if you're in, you're in all day or until you you kill him. Say, so yeah, he comes through and you get a shot and you kill him. Yep. Yeah. So I. So I not only do I create this incredible hotel i do put a stand up yep and there's that one you know and i showed you that one stand and i only hunted it once but it was an incredibly good hunt got some awesome video yep. footage of some really good deer in there yep. but just not the deer that i was ready, ready to take at that time of the year they just need another year you know? you know that and and why can you access that stand in those 10 days a year 10 days of the year maybe like maybe explain to the listeners why you feel yeah like because you get that there. what that is that is as late October, early November, it is what I'm going to call the pre-rut, just lining up to to the official dose coming in heat, which would be called full rut and lockdown and all that taking place. So at that time of the year, prior to that, does and fawns are in those bedding areas 
way before you can get in there in the morning. At that time of the year, because of the pressure that the bucks and the does are constantly moving, you know, they're just as active in the, in the sexual games as the males are. So they're hitting scrapes. They're, they're sending scent communications to the, to the sires that they want to choose. And a lot of research has proven that older does will, will pick older bucks and younger does will pick younger bucks. So there is a mechanism that goes around. So during that time frame, these deer that are always out in the open fields begin getting away from those open fields because every time that mature doe goes in that open field, here's that young buck out there hassling her, and she's tired of being hassled. So now, usually about an hour to 45 minutes after daylight, those does and, and young bucks that are cruising around in all these open fields harassing each other move into the bedding area. Well, I got in there 45 minutes before daylight. So I've been in there for two hours, and now here come a bunch of does. Here come some young bucks. Pretty soon a big mature doe comes walking through, and, and you hear that grunt and that heavy, and you look off, and, and you, you oh, hear that. You, 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 know, you, hear, you know it's a big deer. You can just tell by the way it's stepping, and he shows up, and that's the one time I'll take the risk to go in there. Oh, man. You get me fired up for November. Oh, we got a long ways yeah, off, buddy. I know it. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. And inside there... I mean, like you said, you're doing the clover and the chicory, and um, what I also noticed was all the successional growth, the, the young plants in there, all at, at deer head level. I mean, you were cutting off some of them, you know, waist high or whatever. Right. Um, yeah. Just chopping some of those young trees off. Good point. What are you doing there for? So, so you're trying to create an opening, and there's no doubt you're going to cut some trees at, at at ground level and and i spray them with an herbicide because i don't want them to come back up and and there's a lot to be said about stump sprouts and all the great things but here i'm trying to create an opening for deer to lay in and then on the edges of those openings i've got early succession and a lot of those smaller trees say size of your thumb to an inch and a half in diameter i'll cut waist high and they will sucker up right about three feet off the ground and that is the deer's level that's where their head is so i'm putting food right where it needs to be you know, and, and I've made that comment that deer tend to be a bit lazy, yeah. but they are, yeah. you know, and so if food is available and it's right there, especially say you're a, a landowner that has hired me and you've got a plan and you've got a really nice buck and you're seeing him a lot. He's, he's on that property. He's on your camera a lot, but he just needs another year. And and as, and as, and as great a deer as he is, and you've killed deer, you'd love to go to that next level. I, this deer, if he's two and a half, he's awesome. He's hundred inch, but imagine, amazing what he'd be if he's three. Well, if you've got food during that crazy time period in and around those does, maybe instead of him getting up and going a hundred yards and feeding in the neighbor's bean field, he doesn't get in trouble and die. Great point. So all these thick areas of cover, and you saw I have, you know, multiple areas with cover and food and cover and food and networks that all connect one another. It also takes a buck a long time to journey through all those. I mean, yep. you saw he, he can be a really busy guy, and you were probably on, let's say you are on half of the property. So you saw 30 acres. It seemed like 250 acres, didn't it? I mean, it we just, were out there for a few yeah, hours. Yeah, I mean, it was just huge. edge, and you also notice I compartmentalize a lot. Yep. I reduce a deer's ability to see any long distances other than my destination food plots. And that's very interesting to a guy like me or most of our listeners with smaller properties. Um, not that most of them do, but people that do who have 15 like me, if I can turn 15 to feel like 20, 25, 30, that's pretty interesting stuff. You're darn right. And it's going to give you uh, a couple of things. You're going to have deer that, that don't leave when you step in. Okay, they're going to be comfortable. They're, it's thick enough. And then you're also going to have more options. You've created thickness and you've got a, a network and a maze of travel corridors. And now instead of just one or two ideal stands, now you got six or seven. Yep. And now yep. you're not over hunting that spot too many times. Because at the end of the day, I'm a low impact hunter, very scent control, wind conditions, you know. And it's yeah. very strategic. And, yeah. And it's not for the weak of heart. Because number right. one, you got to be very disciplined to do, to be able to know you got nice deer back there. And you're not in there, man. You're just driving, you're getting game camera pictures. Man, look at him. He's beautiful. He's, he's hitting those vines that I've got hanging. You know, I'm just waiting for the right conditions to go in and hunt him and hunt him successfully. But yep. if you've got multiple locations, even if you hunt him twice and it just didn't work out, then the wind switches from the north to the southeast the next morning. Now you can go pick your southeast stand within 80 to 100 yards of that same location and still have just as good a chance. In fact, better because it's 
It's a brand new stand. You haven't contaminated it with any of your human scent, regardless of how good you are with your scent control. And so it's it's a new day. It's a new opportunity. No, that's that's huge. I mean, I just the amount of edge. You, we couldn't see 30 yards or 40 yards unless we we're in a food plot. Um, and like you said, if I can break up a smaller property like that or our listeners could with their property, that's awesome. And to think that this was all a bean field at one point, you know, and now we're oh, looking yeah. at you know, 30-year-old pines yeah. and everything else oh, that I are mean, just creating all this I mean, edge. That, that part was, it's really, you know, you got to realize everyone on those pines were, you know, 8 to 16-inch to right. seedlings or one- or two-year-old transplants yep. at one time that I, myself and my sons and my wife put in the ground. Yep. That's a another thing I want to talk about. Um, hey, Pepper. That's a... Uh, a lot of these things that you've put in there have been maybe growing for 30 years right. or whatever. Yep. And say I want to get that that same 30-year result quicker than that with a different plant that might do the same thing. What do you have out there that was fast growing that maybe our listeners could take and maybe achieve the same result that you did with the pines and the blockade, maybe some of the thermal cover, but don't maybe want to wait 35 years. Right. Uh- one of the one of my most successful trees that grows very fast and is really thick, and you saw them, is stream co willow. In eight years, you can have 10, 12 feet of growth without any doubt. It grows fast. And the more sun it can get, and, and it, again, it has to have moisture. It has to have so, wet feet. So willows like wet feet. Okay. And it doesn't mean you can't grow them where there's not a lot of wet ground, but it takes a while. It might take three years for its oh. tap root to finally get down there into that resident water table. And, uh, gotcha. you know, you hear my whining dog. Yeah. You by the way, her, you want to let her in. More yeah, I'm going to let yeah. Pepper in because she's just standing here by yeah, the door. You're good. She's just got to say hi. Of course. Uh, it was finally great to meet her today after how many videos I've seen her in, you know. Yeah. I just hope she doesn't step on any of the, oh, any of the dials. I'll just keep her over here. Um, hi, girl. So, yeah, the stream co willow, hey. that's a good one. That, I mean, you said you placed one stalk in the ground how many years ago, and it is literally, um, like, bigger than my garage. Like, I mean, yeah. it's blowing oh, up yeah. and there's scrapes all and the way around and there's hundreds and hundreds of stems coming up out of yeah. the ground and, and yeah. that's the nature of the stream code okay. is it's, it's it tends to do that okay but i'm going to say let see this is 2019 so that was about 2003 okay that that got stuck in the ground that wasn't wasn't too that terribly long ago, long ago. No. nope okay. and again like i say within that first six or seven years it was huge and full of scrapes all the way around and you saw there's rub, they rub all the limbs and there's a lot of horizontal limbs horizontal that they rub rubs. on them yep and That's uh, the first Michigan horizontal rub I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Um, at least more than just one. They yeah. were everywhere. Yeah, there were quite a few, weren't there? Oh, my gosh. Um, w- what else do you have that that maybe you could plant as a screen or, or a wall to walk behind that that won't take 20 years or you know, anything like that? Um, what else are you finding that's you know, helping? I, I will tell you that uh, miscanthus grass, mm-hmm. you know, it's perennial. Mm-hmm. Takes, you know, you're probably looking at about a four-year investment to full maturity, but you're usually doing pretty good by, pretty about, quick. by about year three. And, you know, that clumps up and it starts out, you know, with eight, nine stems. And by the time you're in a year four, it's about 30 stems. And, and it kind of reminds you of bamboo. I mean, if you've yeah. seen it. And it stands up to snow and ice. Wow. And it doesn't take long. And you can have a screen or say maybe you want to compartmentalize and stop deer from seeing distances. Maybe it's not a screen that you use, but yep. it can certainly block views. Okay. And then, you know, the traditional Norway spruce, white spruce, those work fine. You saw I, I used a lot of them because back in the day, 30 years ago, nobody knew about miscanthus grass. No. Uh, stream co willows, I'd never heard of them. You know, I finally just stumbled across them, you know, several years ago. And then uh, the hybrid sorghum. You know, if you're looking for a quick, hey, I want to do something in one year. And, and let's face it, a lot of us want things quick, right? So hybrid sorghum, Egyptian wheat, there's another product out there that name is used. Um, it's an annual. If it's planted correctly, you, again, it can get, you know, 10, 12 feet tall, 8 feet tall, depending on the variety. In, in the, the first year. In the first year. Wow. In, in, yeah, that season. From, from that June year. through mid-August. Yep. And so now you've got this great screen or whether it's maybe you're just trying, again, trying to reduce deer's ability to see. And if and if deer can't see a distances, neither can you. It's good for both of you. Sure. Because now you're slipping into places and you can't see, and they can't see, and that's all good because, you know, they use their eyes just as much as they do their nose. Yep. And, uh, you know, so those are probably the fastest, you know. And, and there's a few tree varieties out there. I would say uh, 
shagbark hickory. Um, that's a fast-growing tree when it first emerges up out of the ground. Okay. I mean, it doesn't take long for hickories to get, say, from 3 feet to 12 feet. That's probably all going to be done in a 10-year time frame, as long as it's where it's getting abundant sunlight. Okay. If it's stuck inside the woods, getting shade, then you're talking about a whole different cycle. Gotcha. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. You know, and, and lots of different pines. I'm not a big pine lover, and, and you saw I, I grow a lot of different conifer species, you saw the ones I like, and, and I showed you, you know, why I, I'm not a, you know, white pines, you know, it's a state tree. It's a great looking tree it, as it gets older. And you saw I have some that must be, what, 36 inch diameter. And oh, I yeah. I realized I planted those when they were a foot tall. Oh, my gosh. Um, you know, and they're 40 feet tall. Yeah. But they tend to lose their lower limbs as right. they get older. Right. So. And then you, you had know, some ascanthus backed up against yeah, that. Yeah. And so I put some ascanthus to make up for it. So. Uh, this year, I'll be in good shape. That'll be yeah. a wall of cover, and the deer won't be able to see into that food plot from there. So I hope that answered that question. It does. It does. And I just don't, don't think that, you know, if, if everybody thinks, oh, Jake's got 35 years worth of working on a property, that's the only way you can do it. No, there's plenty of other things that you're also incorporating along with the stuff you planted that long ago. Right. Um, I just and, and that leads into this next topic. You have trees of and shrubs of all different ages out there. It's not like you planted all these 35 years ago and then stopped planting things. No. Right? Uh, there is a year I don't plant. I still plant. I'm going to plant this year. Yep. I'm consistently planting and having, because I still believe that the whitetail likes age variety of age class. That's interesting. So and even though it's a lot more work, mm -hmm. you're still doing it. It is. And, and like it or not, you're going to have success and trees will die due to disease Due to cold temperatures, uh, there's all these different reasons that trees die. You know, rabbits are known to girdle, mm -hmm. uh, voles, mice, all that kind of things happens. There's a lot of different factors that kill trees. So you can be successful, say, five years ago you planted them. They're all getting six, eight feet tall now. They're really starting to look. You get you walk your property this spring, and my gosh, nine, ten of them are turning brown in July. What's going on? Oh, you walk up, you sickening. look, and sometimes there's no visual evidence around the the, the the trunk there's no girdle but the tree's dead so when the tree dies i cut it off and replant it you know and there now it's a whole different age class but that's good you know because in mother nature nothing comes up all at once and that's really all i'm trying to do is mimic ah. what you what, what you really see you know yeah yeah that's a good way to look at it i mean you you had uh mature pines and you had you know four-year-old pines yeah. and younger then yeah. you had all kinds of the um what was that one was it a plum tree that we we're talking about oh yeah that american the, plum yeah tell yeah. me about those you had a bunch of those that you planted you know, and now I, they're showing up everywhere yeah yep I, I had american plum uh that i probably started planting on the property about mm, 20 years ago and and they're they're they it's not like they've got a thorn but they have a funny short stem that seems thorny when it's first growing but they they have a fruit about the size of a grape that starts dropping in early to mid-september it doesn't benefit us from a bow hunting standpoint, but it's a great food source for deer. And once th that fruit starts dropping, deer eat them, all, all small animals eat them, turkeys eat them, and before you know it, you got plum seed everywhere, and you saw how thick that fence row was, and literally it was from two rows of plums, and now it's 30 yards thick, and it's just dense as can be, and I've, I've wow. cut a trail system through it yep. for the deer to use. Yep. Yeah. And that's just all through, you know, attrition. <laughs> wow. Wow. They sell those locally? Yeah, yep. you usually yep. can find American Plum in a lot okay. of your different uh, okay. tree suppliers. I'm going to have to get those on the property. And, uh, I mean, the animals are doing a lot of the work for you. That's uh, pretty cool. I'll bring up another one because yeah. I showed them to you, and that was the filbert tree. Yes. Which is a witch hazel, okay. and it's a nut. So it's more in a shrub than a tree. Okay. But I planted those, again, uh, when we were building the house, so 20 years ago. And I actually planted two here in the yard, which Anaya wanted me to get rid of because they have, you saw they have multiple stem, stem density kind of thing. She didn't like them in the yard. And so I moved a few out back, and now they're all over the place because, again, the turkeys and the deer and, the, and all the small animals, uh, probably some of the squirrels bury them. But the bottom line is they're growing all over, and there's a lot of them in my hinge cuts. So you get into those open mm -hmm. areas, and I think what's happening is the turkeys are finding them, eating them. They go into the hinge cuts. They get up on those hinge trees and roost and you yeah. know, yeah, they, they pass them through their system, and they're all fertilized, and off they they're off and running. You know, beautiful. Yeah, all the work's being done for you. There. Yeah, yeah. No, that's awesome. And I want to talk about um, some of the pathways that you have on your property. I mean, you were making not just through the hinge cut areas, 
which was interesting. You had like a circular path around each little batting area and then some crisscross path, paths through it. Excuse me. And it seems like you um, you have access paths, mode paths, all over the place oh, that yeah. you put in there. Yep. And you manicure these in August, like you said, every year. Yes. Tell me about those. Why do you do that? Um, or instead of just letting the deer have what they have and trying to hunt yeah, that. You know, um, I manicure them for uh, two reasons. The most important reason is for the deer. And they do they do like them. And, and anybody who's cleared under an overhanging branch at the right location gets a scrape. So you, you're, you're brush hogging, you're expanding your food plot, and you got a big oak tree, and now you're mowing underneath it. And next thing you know, you got a scrape. So I, I find from from mowing these access paths that I can drive, say, a, a, a electric cart down, or I can take my tractor down, so it's four or five feet wide, I get a lot of scraping and rubbing action. You saw all up and oh, down. Yeah. There. And again, both sides of it, it's just thick cover, isn't it? It's just really thick, and the deer can't see really outside of that, but they're walking in and out in it. And there's little spurs. They can go to this bedding area and that bedding area. And then I'm going into these narrow paths, more about 20 to 30 inches wide. And those are very distinct deer movement patterns i'm trying to create okay and you notice they all led to a stand every one of them and again i'm just trying to put those deer where i want them so everything that i do is you know number one it's just a lot of fun and i i, I experiment like crazy you, you've seen yeah, it. oh yeah I try a lot of different ideas see what works and then when i find what works and my goal has always been to try and get as close as i can to older age class animals because i just love archery hunting and man when you can get a four and five year old deer within 15 18 yards of you in southern michigan you've you've had to do a few things right and yeah. i've done that you know for a number of years over and over again so i know it's not an accident i've got a system that works okay. so it's it's a strategic plan about when and how and then and then i'm 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 creating the location you know I, multiple interests there's a lot of reasons for those deer to be there you know everything food cover scraping rubbing and then social activity and you saw everything from isolated bedding areas to socialization areas lots of rubs scrapes yeah. old rubs from 20 years ago five years ago three years ago and then the last season so you can just see that the bucks are in here all the time lots of different types of bedding yep bedding yep. up high high elevation low elevation cover yeah, it all you really yeah. yeah no you really cover it all and and those pathways, um, the deer aren't using them, and they're they're everywhere. They're yeah. also your access too. And, and the neatest thing about those pathways, right? They're access, and I'm going to run cameras at certain times of the year, and I, and I literally run my tractor and brush hog and mow it. So you use and, the tractor and brush hog only, or do you have like and a? I, and I also one? use I also use the the zero turn on some okay. of those yeah. larger ones, and yeah. then I've got that walk behind brush hog. Okay. That I use. But the neatest thing about all those paths is that every one of those paths connects to another path, and ultimately they lead to two places: food or bedding areas. Or three places: tree stands. Too. Well, past the tree stand. Yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, you. Yeah. Uh, hey, every time you you know see all this activity and look up, oh, another yep, perfect stand right there. Know. Let's talk about all the scrapes. So you said social. Um, how many scrapes are you putting out? Say you had that, that one food plot that was almost two acres. Um, how many scrapes do you think are around that food plot, um, around the edges? Probably around two dozen, at least. Yeah. And how many of those are you putting there? I, I'm i probably putting half of them. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And then they're just, you know, every once in a while, like you get, uh, I showed you that one, it was an autumn olive, you know, and autumn olive has that awesome arching effect. Yep. And that archway right on the edge of that bean field and, and of course there's other things planted in there besides soybeans but yeah it was at the right location it's at the right height and yeah those bucks were using it you know and good for yeah. them oh yeah well it's interesting you're not just putting one no i'm you're putting a camera yeah. on it i mean oh i'm you know my part of my philosophy is to keep bucks busy you know those one thing i've learned is early in the season if, if you a lot of guys go well it's, it's mid-october it's time to put the cameras out well i put the cameras out in august and what I noticed in August on these scrapes is does and fawns are all over them. And you don't get a lot of bucks using them. Really? You'll get a few, but not it's a lot. It's a social area, right? But what's amazing is the, the high number of doe and fawn use on scrapes. And as the season progresses and the bucks go through velvet peel, it's a lower number of does and a higher number of bucks. I th honestly think that in the world of Mother Nature, the doe starts it. And everything wow. I've read, everything I've 
personally been told by deer biologists is the doe sets the stage. It's her scent, it's her pheromones, it's her hormone transmission information on that licking branch that's communicating to that buck. Wow. Back to your comment about knowing deer biology yeah, to it's, be, yeah. become a better habitat yeah, manager. Right? You'll be much better. Uh, one of the things I know you brought up, you haven't asked me, I'll just mention it. Sure. Is anytime you're making changes, whether you're creating uh, early successional growth, doing hinge cutting, maybe just doing timber stand improvement, trying to do uh, screening, be sure to crouch down and get yourself about three feet off the ground and look at it from a deer's perspective. When we're standing up in a hinge cut, we go, oh, man, this just looks awesome. Man, this looks really great. Well, bend down at three feet, see what it looks like. That's the deer's view. A lot of things are high enough to look like it's blocking vision from our, you know, from five and six feet. Mm -hmm. You drop down to three feet, it's a whole different world. Great point. So you notice I did that in a few of those places. I get I get into the thick areas and I go, okay, now let's bend down now and show you what this deer is actually seeing because they're not as big as we think they are. I mean, really, they say their their shoulders somewhere in that three feet to forty inches. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these, and most of the time, I mean, once in a while you'll see a deer with its head up erect, but most of the time when they're walking and feeding, that head's kind of out in front of them. Yeah. 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 Are you not seeing that enough habitat managers recently are doing some of that, looking from a deer's level? I mean, you made it a point to to make sure I understood it, which is interesting because I don't feel like I do it enough. Well, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe, I think there's a lot of habitat managers that that's just one of those things they know. They take it for granted. Gotcha. They just don't mention it to anybody. Gotcha. And gotcha. I've just come, you know, because I've worked with a lot of clients and I've found that there's a lot of things I take for granted that I'm trying to make sure I get to the client. And it's that piece of information right there. Mm -hmm. Just do a good job at it. That's for sure. That's for sure. Now, how do you go f from like the... A 30 or 40 deer per square mile to 100 deer per square mile and uh and never get busted i mean or not get busted like i just can't it was just tough for me to, to fathom how all this works without ever getting picked off or smelled or anything you have a pretty um strategic way you use access and then how clean your boots always are to wear even if you have to go in over a deer trail or where a deer's going to come in later that night, you're usually okay. Oh, yeah. Yep. I finally got myself there. It took a long time to get there. Did it? It did, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would say it was 20 years of constant experimentation to get there. But clean boots, and and I, I can't say that enough. And people go, clean boots, boots what's that mean? And and I didn't get spray a chance it, to, spray it with some to, to spray. show you my scent control room, oh, yeah. but I do have a sink there. So, I mean, the truth is... If I've been hunting and I've got 100% prepared boots and say now I've come in and I'm, and I'm finished, it's dark or, or, or it's midday, whatever it is, those boots come off and they get rubbed and, they, and soap and baking soda with a brush and washed with water right then. And I always have three pairs of boots and I rotate those three pairs of boots through a drying and a scent and sitting in a vat full of zeolite and carbon, okay? And the... I do know that the bottoms of those boots do not smell like boots, and they don't smell like humans. And, of course, they never go anywhere except on the ground, and it's the last thing I put on because I'm walking right out my back door to, to hunt. Yep. And so that, that is a huge contributor. You know, guys that have to drive, okay, a lot of people have gotten into the I tote system. Yep. So you've got to get in a vehicle, you've got to drive, and anybody who's really disciplined, who has literally has a complete change of clothing, and they literally get out of that vehicle, and they're standing on either super clean mats or something, and they're getting out of their street clothes. And then they've got wipes, and they're wiping their bodies down because, like it or not, those street clothes have some odor on it. And then they're and then they're starting to cover themselves with scent-free clothing again, and you know, go, eventually dressing into that 100%, in their opinion, scent-free boots. Then they're going to work, you know, stand or access or how far they've got to walk, that that goes a long way into how successful that hunt is going to be and probably even more how successful that second or third hunt after that is going to be because they didn't leave a lot of telltale signs for those deer to figure out until he hunted that next time. And I think that's what a lot of hunters do is they don't give it they don't give it that much seriousness 
They go, oh, it's no big deal. It's just a couple of does. So she stops her foot. I've seen that before. It doesn't change the deer. And, and they just kind of blow it off. And they don't realize what the impact that has over time. So you could have 70 acres that you've been working on for how long? And if you weren't taking that part serious as you do, would you be as successful as you are? Oh, no, not at all. And I can tell you, 20 years ago, the habitat was pretty good, but I was not taking my scent control and my access nears, and I wasn't as successful. Wow. You know, wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's how important that is. Yep. Yeah, that's awesome, Jake. Um, I need to get better at that. Matter of fact, I have to drive to where I hunt. What would you do with your boots then? Just a quick example on, on how you would handle so that. So I would make sure... Uh, 24 hours before I drove, I washed those boots off with hot soapy water and baking soda, put them out in the sun, let them dry. Then I would take your typical body spray that everybody sells to supposedly get rid of your human odor. And I would spray those boots until they're dripping wet. Tip them upside down on a boot dryer and cover the bottoms of those boots with zeolite or activated carbon, one of those two. And let those boots dry with that product on the bottoms. Okay. And then put them in a tub, a sealed tub, which has probably an inch or two of zeolite or activated carbon in that. Close that lid and shake that tub like crazy so that that dust is inside and outside all over those boots. Wow. And then when you, and they're going to be the last things you put on. You've grabbed your bow, you've got your camouflage, your, your backpack is on, you're sliding on those boots. You t make sure you tuck in your camouflage. Tuck it inside. Don't let it go over the tops. And then walk into your stand, and those does will not bust you. I need to do and, that. And, you know, that six-year-old doe, and we have a lot of them in yeah. southern Michigan. Yeah. So, or five, or, or however old she is, and she's got twins and triplets. And So if she walks by your stand, and let's say she's about 24 hours from being in heat, and it's, man, it's, it's Halloween, it's a great night, you've been waiting for two weeks to get out here, you're in your stand, and she has crossed your path and not even wiggled her tail. And she went on about her way. And 30 minutes later, you hear, you hear a little bit of heavy walking. You hear a deep grunt. He's coming. He's behind her. He's smelling her. Now he's going to cross your path and give you that shot. Imagine if she just stood there and stomped her feet and ran away. Because those, all deer have an inner digital gland, which is right between the hooves. And deer researchers will say that when a deer is just going about its business, walking, it's leaving a normal scent. When it's alarmed and stopping its feet, then it's an alarm scent. So if she stopped her feet and blew at you and then moved on, that hunt is over when he gets to that spot. If you're not able to get a shot before then, there's about there's trouble about to happen. And I can tell you I wow. made those mistakes. Right. I was there. Okay. Right. I don't I don't put myself there anymore. Wow. I didn't so, know that. So it can be, you know, I mean it sounds like a lot of work to people, but once you've done it and got your system down, it's not a lot of work. Right. And it's like anything. you used to it. Yeah. And like, you know, one of the things I've noticed as you're preparing the boots and you're getting dressed and you're using your scent control uh, regimen and it's new to you, you'll find that, that it's very successful. And you kind of get excited knowing that I'm going in tonight and I'm very low impact. And you're out and you, you just go in with a lot more confidence and confidence. In, I don't care what it is you're doing. If you believe that you're going to be successful, you will be. That's amazing. Right, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Positive positivity yeah. And, yep. and just uh, that confidence. I, yeah, that's that's pretty big stuff there. I mean, the fact that you can put all this work out here, food plots, trees, whatever you want, water holes, the whole thing, and that is just as important. It is, and and I think that's probably very underrated today. Yep. Yep. Because you know the the United States is covered with, uh, especially the Midwest, awesome hunting ground, with everything from one hunter for every six miles. To 30 hunters per square mile, which is half of Michigan, yep, right? Yep. And so those hunters that we see on TV and all dressed in camouflage, and there's nothing against them. They're great people. They represent an incredible industry, and everybody loves to watch those hunting shows. But what you don't realize is this is a low-pressure area. Not many people come in here, and even the deer that occasionally bump into a human don't have the reactions that these high-pressure states. And it's not just Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, right. uh northern indiana has a lot of pressure so we're not the only ones with pressured deer but as soon as you start getting into pressured deer they act a little bit differently 
Yes, sir. <laughs> yep. So yeah, we know that challenge here in Michigan. So all of those precautions are worth it. If your goals are to see and harvest older deer, whether that's older does, older bucks, maybe you've got, uh, you know, the, the term shooter, you've got a shooter on camera, yeah. you've got a small property, and I'd just love to get an opportunity on this deer. Well, you can go about it like you always have. Doesn't mean you won't kill him, but it's probably not. Cause you've, or you can change how you're hunting, dial up your scent control, and then also watch these conditions about downwind of bedding areas, wind conditions, cold fronts, high pressure, all these things we've discussed on prior podcasts, yep. and then get a lot more strategic about putting yourself at the right time when that deer is moving. I love it. <laughs> I mean, if there's one, one common thing that I kept noticing today when i would ask why or how this works or why you did plant it here did that there it was all in very it was very intentional everything was intentional and your attention to detail is very high when it comes to your oh, habitat yeah. or your hunting or your scent or or whatever part of this you're putting in back here i mean that combined with how much work it takes to hinge cut that many trees or to plant that many trees or to do all that you've done back there on the one half of the property that I walked. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. And, and I will say, it, like with so many things we do, it's in the details. Mm -hmm. So there's habitat management, there's food plots, and there's hunting. And then there's scent control, there's precise travel corridors, there's multiple licking branches, there's all kinds of doe bedding areas, all kinds of buck bedding areas, with manicured trails that connect. And I walk all those trails in late... August, which is just prior to hard antler for two purposes to manicure those trails but we get a lot of storms in the summer so let's say you you don't know about these details man you worked really hard all all february and april and you're done in may and man i've created the trails i got the corridors my stands hung, i'm good and you don't walk those trails in august and there's been two or three thunderstorms and this big corridor that was going to drop deer right onto your path has been blocked by three or four dead ash trees from the emerald ash borer that have completely closed off that trail and deer are veering off at a 30 degree angle and go, now going by your stand 100 yards away because it's completely pushed them and you don't know that and the only way you're going to know that is going in there and checking on those areas in late august yep so late august is uh, uh that's when i do all my licking branches and that's when i walk all those trails and mow all those trails when i walk behind mower Wow. And it sounds like a lot of work. It's not. I mean, they, they move pretty quick. It's, you know, okay. even though it's a lot, it's a network, I pretty much get everything done in one weekend. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of mowing yeah. on that. It um, is. Now, I, I meant to ask this when we we're talking about scrapes. Um, tell us about how you do your scrapes real quick in terms of the cord and the trapping wire and the vines. Uh, I meant to hit that back there. Okay. Let's cover um, that real quick. You know, location is everything. Okay. And... Let's say you don't have any of these trails, but you've got natural deer trails. I try to look where at least two deer trails cross. Sometimes you run into uh, maybe there's a wetland and a, and a ridge, and you've got three trails that all come to one point, and they all converge, and, and some of them cross, or maybe all three come to one and join into one. So that's a, that is a place where multiple deer are coming to. So what a great all location. Right. Yep. So number one, location is really important. Now, edges of food plots can be really good, and and internal bedding area travel corridors can work really well. But whether it's a, a living tree that can be a white oak, it can be a red oak, it can be a hickory tree, it, it can be basswood, it can be just about any tree you want. And if the limb happens to be coming out of this tree that is from 6 to 10 inches in diameter and say it's, it's up over your head, you can attach parachute cord to it, pull it down, get it about shoulder to elbow high, Trim the limbs. Say it's got five or six limbs. I just look at what any natural licking branch. And when you look at any natural licking branch, you'll notice several of them broke off and one left. It becomes a point of focus. So that's all about putting scent. So I try to trim off the six or seven, turn it into one or two main limbs, small limbs, about the size of my finger. Trim them. Take the, the parachute cord, pull it down to shoulder to, to armpit height. And then I just take a rake with me. And I scrape, you know, and just basically put a three-foot diameter, you know, just looks like a natural scrape. Now, if it's a lot of grass and weeds, I might have gone in there two weeks earlier and sprayed it with Spray Roundup. Roundup, yep. And then come yep. back and I, and I spray it. But, I mean, it's, it's just that simple. There's And you, and you can hang a, a 
a vine, you know, I, I cut a lot of grape vines. You can hang vines, and they're wound with wire, and, and, and there's trapping wire, which is just a soft, bendable, pliable wire, and you can order it in a lot of different places. And I use that to attach these vines to, it could be a hickory tree, it can be a walnut tree, it doesn't matter what kind of tree it is. And if you put it in the right place, you're going to get a ton of activity. And you've, you've seen the kind of activity that I get in there. And you saw the bucks are still actively using all my scrapes right now. Right now. Yeah. And we're yeah, in early busy. May. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, just the social aspect of it, like you said, yeah. with the does and, uh, you know, even button bucks you've seen working scrapes before. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy. Like, just, I mean, you really are doing everything you can for the deer. I am. In terms I'm, I'm of trying really hard to give them can. kind of, you know, it's overused term, but it's a utopia. Okay? Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, if I can give them everything they want, you know, food, water and cover and lots of it. And then also all their social, they've got places to rub, places to scrape, and then all kinds of locations where they can meet up with each other. Yep. So many different diverse food sources. I mean, it's hard to, I, I never tried to count them all, but man, there's a lot of different diverse Oh my gosh, sources. yeah. You know, everything from native to natural, the things I've planted, and there's a lot of choices for food. And, and you know, and we get to that say late muzzleloader season and we're getting towards the end of december and now there's you know colder temperatures we're getting snow and now there's more deer per square mile here every day and so that's when all my early succession and everything i've worked so hard to create now is is paying off because there's lots of browse there's still available food in the food plots and it gets these deer through that winter in a really good shape yep so, and yeah so we saw a couple of nice tracks today. Oh, yeah. So it looks like a couple of the deer that I've been paying attention to are still calling this place home. And Oh, man, I can't wait for some July, August pictures oh, on that. I, sh I should get some pretty good ones. I'm Holy hoping. cow. Yeah. 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 So, uh, Which, to your point, bringing all those deer in in December or uh, towards the end of the year when they're all coming in, you're giving them the free pass. Oh, yeah. You know, people are still hunting, yeah. but yeah. you're, you know, you like yeah. the older age class deer like yeah. I try to chase. And, and that's, um, not only are they enjoying the fruits of all your labor but they're living yeah another year and that's right. big for us guys in michigan pa yeah. new york etc oh it is Indiana. You know, um, um, truly that's kind of my deal you know you asked me i think one question we were out there and i said my goal from from the december 1st on is to get all those bucks that are calling this place home get them through into january get them through the hunting season because yep. it's going to get them into another year's age class and some of those are three and four year olds so that means they move now to four and five year olds and those are tough deer to hunt yep i mean that, that's the ultimate challenge here and i don't care it where sure you're is. hunting it sure you is. Can hunt illinois and iowa a five-year-old buck is still pretty crafty and he only shows up once in a while yep yeah yep. well <clears throat> one thing you said to me at that when we met at that pint night it's like habitat work is like deer hunting all year round oh I mean, absolutely you're, you're thinking about it you're you're strategizing now january july whatever it's part of deer hunting all year round. And, you know, and, and that's where I want to give you kudos. You know, you're, number one, you're, you're obviously a passionate hunter Thank and you. really started getting into hunting. So you had this idea, who knows when, but you were going to come up with this this Habitat podcast. And just look where you've come in the last year and a half, oh, okay? Man, yeah. I mean, it's amazing. You, you guys have made the mark. You've had some great people on. I'm sure you're going to continue to have lots of great people. You've got, I don't know what your audience is, but it's a pretty good number of people, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, the more important thing is, and thank you, first of all, for those nice words. The, the more important thing is the audience that we have are guys that are just as obsessed as you and me. They are. Guys and gals. I know. I mean, and, and so many people, you know, cannot wait for that next podcast. Yeah. And it's awesome, you know. And so I enjoy sharing. I've always believed in that. You know, it doesn't matter what you do. Um, I've always believed in sharing ideas and, and everything. You know that term seed money? Everything is seed money. What you put out in life, you get back. Yep. Okay. Yep. And, and so I, I want people to do well. And, and I know Michigan is a tough state. We've got our challenges. But individual landowners or people that lease properties can make changes and can not only improve their hunting season, but can improve the deer herd in their own way. Yep. And that's all good. Yep. You know? They're the one controlling it with the trigger yeah. finger, right? And yep. We ultimately make that decision, shoot or no, not shoot. Yep. You know, and probably all of us, it looks like, could probably shoot more does. You I know? think you're right. Yeah. I know I'm, I can be guilty of it. And so I'm going to try and focus more on that. But I all think right. I've got the, the passing older deer is pretty much through my system now. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a lot more fun looking at them in a viewfinder than I do, uh, you know, I don't mind putting up 
putting the dot behind the shoulder once in a while. I still oh, do yeah. it. Oh, yeah. I do it when I can. But it sure is fun letting them go and just seeing what they look like next year. Yeah. No, that's awesome. And, you know, and thank you for having me out here. Oh, hey, I you're, mean, you're welcome. This you is know. just obviously what I'm passionate about. Yeah. Um, talk about it all the time. But, you know, you – we give Michigan a bad rap sometimes, and – it's just it's all in good fun because the deer are hard to kill here. The, oh, they are. Uh, older doe, older buck, whatever it may be. Um, but I still love hunting here. Oh yeah. And so when do you I. get that that deer that you you've know? been after, or which, whatever your goal is, uh, it's rewarding. And you know, it's and, rewarding. And you've got a uh, you got your own property. Mm-hmm. You know, you could have a guy say, "Hey, Jared, man, I got this great opportunity. This isn't going to cost you anything. All you got to do is show up here at Iowa. There's a thousand acre farm. We got we got two bucks, hundred and eighty. We got six or seven in the one seventies. You, you're able. To, that's all good. But you didn't. But when you take your farm and you yep. planted the trees, you planted the food plot, you went in there and you hinge cut and you hung that stand, and and maybe you passed that deer last year, and sure enough, he made it, and you finally get a chance, and you killed him here under these Michigan terms." whole lot better than that 200 inch sweet deer that, that outfitter could oh, give yeah. you, right? Sweet as whole, that. Oh, it's very sweet. There's nothing like it. Oh, and you're you know, so right. And, you know, right here, I got a, I got a five-and-a-half-year-old buck right here that I got tons of history with. And even though he doesn't score really well, that was one of the toughest deer I ever had to see in daylight. Wow. Uh, what was his name? Righty. Righty. Okay, yeah. yeah. Yep. I remember yeah. the story in the yeah. QDMA Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah he was, he was, you know, and he was a pure example of the 80-20 rule. Because imagine how many people he dealt with. I mean, oh, yeah. This is a southern Michigan five and a half year old whitetail. Uh, and, probably and it, more than we'd ever like more, to more admit, than, you know? Yeah. I mean, imagine right. his experiences, what he went through with gun hunters and bow hunters and automobiles and the whole nine yards. And he was oh, a yeah. fighting machine. I mean, I've got his, his two year old shed here, but he always, broke, he always broke all his antlers off. That was just who he was. And uh, he's just a, a pure example, you know. Oh, how they go. So, you know, I got two four-year-olds. I got a five-year-old. I got a three-and-a-half-year-old in here in the last. That's a nice three-and-a-half-year-old. Yeah, that's a, he was a good one. That was two. He was 225. Wow. That was the one. Uh, that was that day Jim Brocker and I both killed really oh, nice yeah. bucks. November. Yep. Uh, November 2nd. 2nd, yep. yeah. I was coming back from duck hunting going, why am I not in the deer woods? And, uh, I think Mike Hart just killed yep, that day, Mike too. Mike Hartges and a couple other guys yeah. that, that we knew all yeah. killed on that day. And, again, yeah. if you go back and if you look at those conditions. It was all those things I talk about. It, yeah. it really was. You know, yeah. it was. It was cold front, high pressure. It was Plus, it was the right time of the year. So when those right. mesh, and, you know, when we look at our hunting season and you try to say, oh, you know, from October 25th to November 15th, say it's 20 days. Out of that 20 days, how many of those 20 days do these conditions overlap? Right. You might be down at one, two, three, or four at best. You're right. So Rain, high wind, yeah, whatever there was could always, screw it up. There's, there's right. a lot of things that happen. Yep. So, if, you know, if somebody uh, in, the, in the deer god said, okay, Jake, you can only hunt two days a year, I can tell you what they're going to be. They're going to be post-cold front and high pressure, and they're going to be during that 10-day time period. <laughs> and it's going to be a good hunt. Take right. notes, guys. Yeah. Take yeah. notes. This is some good stuff yeah. here. Yeah. I, uh, and, of course, you know, habitat's everything. You know, if, if, I, yeah. if I hunt those conditions but by that time, in the wrong place, yeah. I'm not going to do very well. Right. So you got to know how deer react to habitats yeah clearly yep and and that is for every property and i go to a lot of properties yeah every property has its own uniqueness it really does the landowner yep the landowner's responsibility is to take notice okay and you notice you noticed that i take notice i tell you all the stories well i noticed the deer did this so i did this i noticed the bucks were doing this so i did this you know and that's what i do i, I observe and see what they how they behave and then i make changes to put myself in the right position next time around and it's working. <laughs> it sure is. It sure is. That's why. Uh, that's why you know you can you know where to go sit on what day and why. Do, like you've, you know. it's not gonna ha- like none of this stuff happens overnight. So no. I don't want people to think it's just a plug and play method. But at it's the not. same time, the more work you put in, you know, if you just go put one little food pot out there and sit on the edge of it. That's gonna be a little bit different outcome than. What maybe could be done with a little bit more time and effort? Yeah, um, scouting or or observation during the season. There's really a there's no easy answer to this. And, and there you, isn't. You, you know, seem it, to have some things dialed it, in though. Uh, where a man, lot of this, a good job. Uh, you know, uh, for you guys out there that are between 21 years old and 35 years old, kind of scratching your head. You know, uh, there is no replacement for time. Okay, it, it you know Mother Nature has its own schedule. Trees are going to grow at a certain rate. 
we're going to have we're going to have wet years like we've got this year. We're going to have dry years. Things happen. But in the grand scheme of things, just keep taking steps forward. Keep reacting. Uh, you know, I, I write down. I've got a log book. There isn't a hunt I don't write down. I don't. You know, I write down everything that's happening. You know, wind direction, temperature, high pressure, low pressure. I write all this stuff down. And, you know, that's that's very good practice to be in because you will notice as you're writing that down, you're going to pay attention to certain things that stand out. Remind me to take a look at that before we leave. Okay, you know, I will. Why? I'll show it to you. Wow. Yeah. A lot of good deer hunters or hunters in general keep logs like that. Yeah. yeah. Detailed logs yeah. are usually... Details, period. Back you know, and, and yeah, I am a scouter. You know, and I've got my own way. And you saw my, my great scouting uh, The kitchen. rig? Yeah. No, my scout, my kitchen. Oh I yeah, scout right, right, right out of my kitchen. Window. I didn't oh, take yeah. you to the upstairs, but even you go upstairs, you can see a little bit better. And that is a great place. And and this house was built to be able to do that. And I've you know got all the warm season grasses around here. So by the fall, you know they're cruising through here all the time. And and uh, so I can gain intel. Pretty good. And then when my my game cameras tell me the other intel that I'm looking for. Cameras don't lie. You know, I would say out of you know out of all the things that. Hunters have had the ability to utilize. Um, game cameras have really taught, I think, not only, yeah, we'll say it helps people kill deer, but not really because there's a, you got to do a lot of things right. Just because you know he's living there doesn't mean you're going to go in and kill him. Right. But you learn an awful lot about deer behavior with right. game cameras. I, I have really learned a lot and learned to take notice as the, you know, I see that deer walking and he's walking from right to left. Why? Right. So I go right back and go to my weather underground. What direction was the wind that day? You know, that was at 1.35 p.m. Well, I wonder where the moon was. And so I go back and I double-check that information, okay? And I look, and a lot of the times it's right where it should be. You know, he's, really? he's generally moving nose into the wind or, cr or crossing the wind, angling into the wind most times. Not always. There is some tailwinding that goes on. And... Oftentimes, if it's not during the rut, but you've got a you've got a buck working a scrape during midday, usually the moon's in the right position. Okay. Yeah, you'll find that pretty much. It, okay. And that's all goes into. Yeah, there's a lot of different factors, and I can't prove any of yeah. them. I just know that from years of data and watching, I do notice that when uh, w when moon's rising or setting or overhead and underfoot, that deer will be active, not for a very long amount of time. You know, we're talking less than an hour. But but there is a time there that they'll be active. Is that when it's directly overhead? Yeah, directly over or directly or underneath. Under, for that hour. Yeah, so we're, we're basically yeah. talking a half an hour plus half it's an hour. At noon, like that yeah. one hunt. Yeah, and rising or fall or rising right. or setting moon as well, you know. And so when, you you know, deer are, are crepuscular animals, meaning, you know, they, yep. they're, they're prey species, they move at dawn and dusk. Yep. So none of that matters if the moon is right during the first hour and the last hour of daylight. Heck, they're moving anyway. So it's Correct. always that, you know, people talk about that 10 to 2. But that is an, a pretty typical time of the year that there's not a lot of deer movement during the non-rut periods. See, it's it's October 10th. Not a lot of bucks moving from 10 o'clock to 2. Usually on their bellies in that great bedding area I walked you through. Just wait <laughs> until this evening to get up and finally move, and yeah. they wouldn't even walk into that destination food plot until it's dark. Right. Okay, they're going to be in those small little hidey hole plots I've got in the bedding areas. and, and so. But if the moon is right, and, man, there's that gravitational pull, well, then, that, you know, and say that moon is right at 3.30 in the afternoon. Well, maybe you slip in a little early, and, and if the wind is right, and, and you just happen to have high pressure. And that was, la you know, last October forest hunt yeah i had high pressure post cold front and i had a setting moon and so you know it, it all rolled in doesn't mean it's every time certainly it isn't you know no, but but you know following again it just helped me i had the confidence i knew going in yeah. it was going to be a great hunt yeah. i could just feel it you know oh. i can't explain that feeling but i feel it every time it happens for everybody who wants to hear about that hunt we had jake on right after that i believe oh, it was yeah. the fifth or the sixth we launched it um about your game plan, huh? Yeah, yeah and that was, uh, and you got a chance to see that food plot today. Oh, and it's man. all been mowed from the blind you shot him out of. Uh, and you could see those mowed trails where I had overseed them with uh, rye and clover, and they're nice and green. He walked right down, <laughs> and just it just showed how old. That's, what, that's something there too. <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people. I've shared that with a lot of people, mm -hmm. and a lot of my clients I mm -hmm. share it with that have the space for a destination food plot right and guys are going to do it this year and i think there's going to be a lot of great 
stories come I love it. mid-October. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, and you reminded me of something. You're kind of covering habitat and hunting today, which I love. You could sit here and do this for hours. Um, I won't put you through that, though. Um, the A lot of the mature buck sightings I had on camera this year on my property were days that I wasn't there because, well, the reason I wasn't there was because it was an east wind. I'm not set up too good for a, an east wind or a southeast wind. I do have access now to, to a spot uh, to be able to access it correctly. But what do you know about mature deer and east winds or an easterly wind? Because, I mean, that's like, of course oh. he's going to show up when I'm not there and can't smell me and this yeah. and that. Like, well, I, you I know, couldn't have hunted him. I've had, I've had incredible hunts under east wind conditions, and I have multiple east wind stands. Okay. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you want to make sure you're ready for it. Yeah. I, I wasn't able to take you to a spot across the water. And if you saw it, and I have just, you know, a slam dunk east wind, and I've killed some nice deer there. Yep, some, of, some of these other big boys on the so wall. There's here something to you. that. Yeah. There's something to that. Yeah. See, this, see this big heavy horned one right here? Yep. This guy, this guy yep. right there. Yep. East wind. Oh, yeah, I mean, so I need to figure out a way to they're hunt. They're out moving around. Right, And, right, of course, right. they're going to use, and I showed you the one stand that's down by the water, and I said that's really yep. good with a southeast wind. Yep. And when I showed you where the, and so the bedding area is to the west, so those deer are heading east, nose into the wind, down along the edge of the water, because that's security, and they can look out into the thick cover, and then they, they know there's no danger down by the water. Nothing's coming across that water after yep. them. So they're running that edge, and that's where that stand was. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I've killed some nice bucks there. I better get set up for it one way or another. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That was just going back and looking at the the history like you were yeah. talking about with your camera. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. Um awesome. Well, so, Jake, what else is uh what else do you want to cover before we wrap this up? I've taken a lot of your time well, today and I know, really do appreciate maybe it. Maybe one thing we didn't talk sure, about please. is I, I talked a little bit about the food inside of cover, but you saw yeah. some really cool little micro food plots. Yep. I had in in just some trees that I planted along with some early succession. And these are all no-till food plots, okay? I'm going in with a backpack sprayer, yeah. and I'm, I'm killing vegetation. I'm putting the seed down, uh, timing it with rain the best I can, and letting the vegetation lay on top of the seed so that when it does get wet, it holds moisture long enough to get germination, and I'm having good luck. It works. And, and you saw these are tight little areas. And so just because a guy doesn't have any trees maybe he's bought a piece of property and, it, and it's in year six or seven of early succession and you've got some cedar trees and some a couple of young oaks and maples but i mean they're tiny they're an inch and a half in diameter and they're 10 feet tall and he's got maybe some some bush honeysuckle and he's got a little bit of everything he's like well cripe you know i don't i can't hinge cut how can i do this well you can get real creative with little micro food plots and you saw i have all these these trails going to and from, and you saw all the scrapes of that tiny little food plot that wasn't 20 feet in diameter, okay? And so it's, I, I say it's limitless. There is nothing that you can't improve yep. to make your hunting better and to hold more deer. Yep. What did we say earlier? The chocolate syrup on the ice cream, yeah, right? Yeah, there it is. Chocolate syrup on the ice cream. I mean, it's a small so, little thing that you might not even think would be worth doing. Yeah, and then yeah. again, you yeah. had box and, and using again, it. That, that follows up with that statement of details. The guy that spends the time and goes in there in July with his walk behind brush hog or even just a weed eater and weed whips an opening 20 by 30 feet with six trails 50 yards off and overseeds and plants that food plot and hangs a stand and pulls down two or three licking branches and, and you know, he will be rewarded because he went ahead and took the time and did that. And those deer have all summer and fall and that, that real sensitive time of early season to go in there and feed and enjoy the fact that where they're standing, everything's four feet down, so it doesn't matter. There's plenty of cover. There's, you know, there's ragweed and there's, uh, you know, you know, Queen Anne's lace, all this stuff that comes up. And I'm just, I see a lot of properties like this that are, they're 10 years from where they should be, but there's still some trees and some growth and some autumn olive. And so don't don't look at that as, well, this isn't this can be a great deer habitat. It can be incredible deer habitat. And say you had 15 acres of that and you you made seven, eight, nine of those little food locations and they all these little connecting trails. And then you had maybe some autumn olives and some maybe some 
uh, crab apples that were kind of thick and you clear it out with some areas that deer can tuck in underneath the bed down, you've just created that utopia. And if there's not water, go put a little water tub in. Keep it filled. Oh, and, man, and, and you got you, me thinking. <laughs> you got me thinking. And, you know, uh, probably the one thing on my property, we've talked a little bit about it, but you saw this currently today I have very high water. Yes. We've had all kinds of rain. I, I had a backed up discharge that I had to, you know, fix out. I put a yeah, little video, video on, on this week. Yep. And so we got high water. But those water edges create a lot of deer movement. So those habitat people that own properties and are thinking about managing their habitat, they have natural wetlands and creeks and little swamps. Don't discount the edge of that wetland. That is pretty much always a movement pattern. One time or another. May not be this time of the year. May be crazy come November. Right. You know, because deer use certain habitats at different times of the year. Then there's some habitats you see that they use all times of the year. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I know. Uh, I know. So so we've, we've covered a lot of things. Um, every, every day, you know, is a joy to walk out and, and like spend the time. Because I'm not in that, out in that property very often. Okay. And it, it's just great to have done it. And honestly, it, was a, it wasn't a very good hunting property when I first bought it. That's what you were and, telling And me. I did not make it very good either. Okay. I contributed to low deer sightings because of no scent control. Who cared what the wind was? I didn't know about conditions. I just hunted. Okay. I, yep. I like everybody yep. else did. Yep. I mean, I had the passion. Yep. Uh, you know, so it took a lot of years, but I eventually figured it out. And I'm glad I did. Yep. You know? Me too. And the plus I've, you know, I, I think I've helped a lot of clients over the years. You know, I have, you know, now into the hundreds and hundreds of clients through my business. Wow. And, uh, you know, and every time I walk a guy's farm and, and finish up with them with their plan and I bring a ton of information and, and give them a USB drive and I, I review some of that information, they're kind of like you. They, they're so excited. They can't wait to get out there. And I, know, happen, I know. You know. Yeah. And I love to see that because they're going to get out there and they're going to plant plots and they're going to create openings and they're going to cut. You know they're gonna they're gonna cut travel corridors and their hunting's gonna be different at whatever mm-hmm. level. Hey, you know every year's a step, but it's gonna be better. Awesome. And uh, that's all I can tell people to do is just strive for making it better next time. You You've know? done a great job, and you put out a lot of good information on your website and well, your YouTube you. and your Facebook. Um, and just I mean the time you spent with me today, I've learned so much. I'm super thankful that you do this type of stuff. Period. Yeah, you know. uh, even if you didn't want to share it here, I've been following you for years online, so I've I always yeah. appreciated it. Yep. Um, and w- where can uh, somebody look you up, and what are you doing with Habitat Solutions 360 these days that you might want well, to talk about you know, now? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, definitely getting, I would say, more at the top of my career. I've been doing this a long time. I'm uh, still pretty healthy, and God willing, yes, I, can, you I can do this for uh, several more years. Yep. But the travel and, and the, just the, the busyness is kind of catching up. And so I'm looking forward to uh, reducing uh, how many properties I personally go to. But I do have an announcement that's coming up. Habitat Solutions is expanding. Oh, wow. And is starting to bring on apprentice that will be working with me to help clients after they've been trained with me. Wow. Okay. So the business is going to continue. And yeah. my goal is yeah. to feed the passionate people because ultimately I'm going to get to a point where I can't do this every day. Right. And I want to see people be just as good at it as I am, helping future clients, future sure. property continue owners. continue on. So HabitatSolutions360.com is my website. Mm-hmm. My Facebook page, Habitat Solutions 360 great Facebook page. I also have YouTube, Habitat Solutions 360 LLC. Okay. You'll find two YouTube channels, and it's a long story, but I had to go with the new <laughs> YouTube channel just because of my old outdated Google email versus Gmail. And this is complicated, but hey, ch- things change, and that's just reality of the world. But I think I've got something like 30-some, maybe almost 40 new videos. I've got a lot of content coming out. Okay. There's new things I'm doing. There's uh, more pieces of detailed information of education that's going to be available on the YouTube channel, and I always put it on the Facebook page, too. Gotcha. So it's a great way for anybody to learn. And and I I will say one thing, Jared, is there are a lot of people that contact me that have never been clients of mine that were lurkers and and went to my Facebook page Mm -hmm. and in the fall send me these detailed 
messages with, a, with their picture, their best buck ever. They say, you know, I've been po following you for three or four years. I started doing this. I just want to thank you for the information you put out because awesome. I would have never killed this deer. And I, at the end of the day, you know, there's nothing more rewarding. That's the best part, isn't you know, it? Uh, you know, we're all human. Okay. Yeah. We can't take anything with us. But right. if I can put a glimmer in somebody's eye before I'm off of this world, then I think I've done a good job. That's awesome, Jake. So Well said, man. Well said. Yeah, you're welcome. And uh, th thanks again for having me out. I really oh, appreciate yeah. it. Uh, the last question I have, so I've been asking a lot of people these days, your favorite tree. So I hear your favorite tree. We'll wrap this up. My favorite tree. If you had to pick one tree as to continue a tree, to plant. Uh, to continue to plant. Sure. Or just your favorite tree either way. And, and why you, Why would you say that's your favorite tree? Boy, I'm sure absolutely. you have more than one. Yeah. But. It's really tough. Uh, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll give you two categories. Okay. If it comes to screening... And, and cover, Norway spruce. Okay. Hands down. Holds its limbs all the way down to the ground. Fast growing. Grows in about every kind of soil condition you can think of. Okay. So it's a really good tree. Uh, favorite tree for cover and hinge cutting from screening to bedding to you name it. This might surprise people. Box elder. Okay. You saw a incredible box elder tree today, didn't you? That one that you hinge yeah. cut is now about 400 trees. Yeah, it's probably. No exaggeration yeah. at yeah. all. Started out as three trees. It was a it was a single stump that went up into three different branches. Yep. They hinged to cut those branches, laid them down. It's a huge screen. It must cover fifty yards. I we, swear, some, it's somewhere in that the area. biggest hinge cut ever yeah. in terms yeah. of sheer volume. The biggest hinge cut I've ever and, seen. And uh, like it or not, the deer like it because oh, I, got, yeah. I got deer bedding under that one spot because rubbing just, it. just what yeah rubbing and yeah they do all that but yeah perfect answer. Yeah. Well, good, perfect. Well, I enjoyed my day with you. Thank uh, you so much again, fun. Jake. Yeah. I appreciate it. Really do. You're Thank welcome, you very Jake. much. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll let you know this comes out. We'll wrap right. it up. Thanks a lot. Thanks, yeah. Jake. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jake, for coming on once again and for giving me the property tour and the listeners the property tour now that they've heard everything we talked about. I really appreciate the multiple episodes you've put forth with us, and uh, thanks for your time. And the listeners, love you guys. Thanks so much for, for supporting the podcast, for all the feedback you've given us, the help, the insight, the constructive criticism, everything, guys. We love it. And most importantly, the reviews, guys. The iTunes reviews or on your podcast app. If you go on there and leave us a five-star review and write a nice little blurb of something you learned or something you like about the show, I'll send you a free Habitat podcast decal. These are five-inch decals with our logo and the website on there, and they're badass. I'll send you a free decal for the review. We have like 106 of them on there now. I've been printing and shipping these decals, so thank you guys for doing that. Please check it out. Everything can be found, if you're new to the show, at habitatpodcast.com. That's our website. We're coming out with a new website soon with some apparel, some decals, some videos, a property tour, a bunch of cool stuff on there. So stay tuned for that. You can find us on Stitcher, Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, the podcast app on your iPhone. You can listen on our website. You can listen to podcasts wherever you can download a podcast. We should be on there. Uh, check out our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We're very active on those Uh multiple times daily we're putting up videos instructionals uh listener stuff listener pictures that people send in questions etc so be sure to check that out and uh last but not least i just want to thank our sponsors for supporting us through all these episodes lincoln roan and the packer max thank you especially number one sponsor from the very beginning thank you for for your support nick percy at killer food plots thank you for your support Nick Nation at the Habitat Hook. We really appreciate your support. Dale Wallace at 5-2 Outdoors. Thank you for joining on recently. We do appreciate your support. Ben Consitis and the Michigan White Duck Pursuit Team. We definitely appreciate your support and trying to help us grow. And Gabe Baselli at Dip That Hydrographics. Thank you for your support. Guys, I know I always say it. Thank you very much. We're here to learn. We're here to do what we can with what we have. We're here to become better habitat managers through the guests and the people that we interview, and we are just here to learn. So thank you so much. Tune in next week as we come back with another great episode of the Habitat Podcast where we become better habitat managers.